Hey, Walter Sorrells back with more tips for the knife maker. Today, zero power tools. So today I'll be showing how to make a mini machete using absolutely zero power tools. Now a sane voice might be asking why? Well, first this is an offering for our prepper, survivalist, low carbon footprint, sustainability guys. Um, you know, something that you can make in the back of beyond uh, in Alaska without any electricity. But beyond that, here's the thing. If you watch a lot of my videos, you'll see me using all kinds of fancy tools, you know, uh, belt grinders and hydraulic forge presses and machine tools and all this stuff. And you might think, well, I guess this is just not for me. Too expensive, too complicated, whatever. But the point of this video is to say that where there's a will, there's a way. Anybody can make a knife. Anybody. Doesn't take a ton of money, doesn't take huge amounts of skill, doesn't take a giant shop. You can do it. So one last point, mini machete. Uh, this one's only going to be about 18 inches. The point of that is so you can fit it in a pack or carry it anywhere. It's real easy to transport. Um, but if you want to make a full-size machete, you just need to start with a slightly larger piece of steel, 22, 24 inches, something like that. All right, let's get on it. Here on this table is most of the material we'll use. And here are most of the tools. Add some clamps, some sandpaper, a vise is nice, a couple other items, and you got everything you need. So we'll start the blade with this, a piece of 01 precision ground steel. 18 inches long, 3 inches wide, a tenth of an inch thick. For those of you with no experience in knife making, we'll start with a key concept here, heat treating. In order to make any kind of tool with an edge on it, you have to start with a steel that's appropriate for the job. Not welding steel, not car bumpers. In order to make steel suitably hard, you have to heat it up and then cool it rapidly. Why? Well, that's for another video, but the point is, 01 steel, 01 being the designation of this particular kind of steel, 01 steel is a commonly available steel that's very forgiving in terms of heat treating and makes an excellent cutting tool. I'll start by drawing the rough shape of my machete on the steel. Then I'll use a hacksaw to start cutting excess steel. You want a high quality bimetallic blade or 01 will wreck your blade pretty quickly. While I'm sawing away here, a quick note on the design of machetes. You'll see a lot of variations, but basically you want as much mass out there towards the end as possible. Machetes should be very thin, so in order for them to chop effectively, you want a big belly out there towards the end to increase the mass. Also, you want what you call a bird's beak on the end of the handle. That's a little protrusion in the handle that you can sort of hook your hand into. A thong hole is good too. A machete is used for vigorous chopping and you want as little opportunity for the blade to fly out of your hand as possible. Still sawing. The more bits you saw off your blank, the less you have to file. Which brings us to the fun part. I'm going to use one of mankind's great tools, the bastard file, to file this more or less to its shape. In my real life, by which I mean in the real world where I'm surrounded by power tools, I use files constantly. They are great, great tools. Also pretty exhausting to use after a while. So I'm filing it to shape, filing, filing, still filing, still filing. At various points I'll use a round file and a half round file. That one looks like I bought it during the Middle Ages. Still works great though. Yeah, 
so that's me still filing. So as you watch me toiling away, you may think, I bet every time Walter turns off the camera, he runs over to some power tool and speeds up the process. Nope. I won't pretend I wasn't tempted, though. There's a reason why ancient blacksmiths were seen as being particularly manly dudes. This stuff is a workout. If you did this day in and day out for your entire life, you'd look like Arnold Schwarzenegger. Well, like you used to look, not the creepy old guy with the facelift. Anyway, done. So we get to put the file away, right? Uh, sorry guys, now we're going to bevel the edge. This is, yeah, even harder. But first we'll take a break and work on the handle. I'm going to use three pins to secure the handle, and I'll also have a quarter inch thong tube for a wrist strap. So I saw a nice little piece of curly maple left over from another project, a little bit oversized. Saw it up, boom. Now trace out the handle on the scales. I'm using a saw and a chisel to clear the waste. Okay, I'll mark my holes, then I'll punch them so the drill won't walk all over the handle. Then I'll drill three 1 8 inch holes for the handle pins and a quarter inch hole for the tube. Now we'll be busting out Grandpa's brace and bit here. No electric drill here, please. Now while I'm drilling, I want to make a point about my objectives for this build. There's a kind of purist, restoration, carpenter kind of approach, you know, that guy who uses antique tools and techniques for sort of deep philosophical motivations. Being one with the wood, understanding how the ancient craftsmen did their thing with the thing, historically accurate restoration, whatever. That's all good, but it's not the goal here. The goal here is just to make a field expedient, but ugly, but effective, tool without using any electricity, period. There's no higher moral objective. You use a brace and bit, your holes will probably be a little more crooked than if you used a drill press. Still, brace and bit will drill a nice hole. So I will counsel you here to use a sharp drill bit though. Drilling with a dull bit by hand is no picnic. The sequence you want to follow in drilling these holes is to drill the steel first, then one of the handle scales, then use locator pins or old drill bits, whatever you need to hold the first piece in place, then you'll flip it over and drill from the other side. This will assure you that the pins will all line up. This is very important. The holes don't line up, you can't put the pins through, and this is all wasted effort. Next, we're going to bevel the edge. This is the step that basically turns this from a flat bar of steel into an actual knife, something that has an edge. 
it is a lot of work. Now my original intent was to bevel the edge back to about three quarters of an inch where I drew this little line. But after filing for an hour or two I decided that actually the design would be a lot better if the bevel was about three eighths of an inch wide. In other words, half as wide. This was not because I was tired of filing, of course. It was because of my sudden realization now that I'd gotten intimate with my materials and had a chance to meditate on the design a little more deeply that a slightly less acute edge would actually be more robust and um, still filing, still filing, still filing. Okay, there, I quit. I've filed the bevels on both sides so that I'm down to about 15 thousandths of an inch on the edge. Thicker than I'd make most knives, but fatigue aside, seriously, we're not making a scalpel here, so this doesn't need to be super thin. Next, heat treating. This step, known as quenching, converts the steel from a softer perlite and cementite mix to a harder martensitic structure. In other words, it gets hard. So, I'm going to be using a propane torch to heat the blade. Obviously, oxyacetylene would work here too. If you don't have a torch, you can heat the blade with charcoal. You'll have to use forced air to get it hot enough, meaning bellows or maybe a hair dryer. So, if you don't have a torch and you want to see that, check out another video of mine where I use that charcoal type procedure. Alright, so O1 is what's known as an oil quenching steel, meaning that you can cool it quickly enough to harden it in oil. So I'm going to be quenching it in peanut oil here, which has among the highest flash points of any vegetable oil. In industry, they have very fancy engineered oils, but vegetable oils will work. Olive oil, mineral oil, canola, all these will be fine for O1. The oil is contained in a quarter inch thick steel tube. Note I'm wearing Kevlar gloves and eye protection in case it flares up. But we'll get to that in a moment. What I'm doing here is just feathering a nice hot flame all over the blade. I want it to reach a sort of cherry red color. Now, that said, I don't really go by color. Different lighting causes colors to appear very differently. Now normally I heat treat in a dark room so that the colors look pretty consistent to me, but the lights used for filming here cause it to appear duller than it might otherwise. Anyway, what I'm leading up to is that sometimes you'll see me dipping the blade down below the edge of the frame. And what I'm doing is touching the blade to a magnet that I've mounted on my oil tank. Now when the steel reaches roughly 1425 Fahrenheit, it becomes non-magnetic. So when I feel that the blade is no longer attracted to the magnet, I know that I'm pretty close to my target temperature, which is roughly 1500 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, is this the most effective way of heat treating? Do they do it this way in industry? No, no, of course not. But if you do everything right, you'll still get an excellent tool. That's one of the great things about O1, is it's pretty simple to do this. And in fact, it's not just good steel, it's excellent. Our result will be kind of ugly, but it's going to be better than any of those cheap machetes you'd find in the camping section at Walmart. Alright, once everything's non-magnetic and I feel like my heat is relatively even along the edge, I'm ready to quench. Now bear in mind, the steel is so thin that you can't maintain a consistent temperature for very long, so you just do your best. You go back and forth really quickly and just try and keep it even. Once you think that it's all to the right temperature, in one swift go, plunge it down into the oil. Then you just leave it there to equilibrate with the temperature of the oil. I put it in right up to the end of the blade. Then after a few seconds, I'll go ahead and immerse the entire thing, including the tang. But we don't want the tang to harden, and that's why we're leaving it out of the oil at first. Now when it's cool enough to touch, I'll take it out and check to see if the quench worked by rubbing the corner of a file on the steel. It sort of skates over the steel down here on the edge, which means that it hardened properly. 
but it bites in on the spine, meaning that the spine remained kind of soft. This is what's known as differential hardening, and it's exactly what I was aiming for. I want a hard edge for edge retention, but I want a soft spine for shock resistance. That's the same principle that they use in making Japanese swords. Next, we'll temper the steel, meaning that we'll heat it again, this time to a much lower temperature. If you have a wood stove, gas stove, electric stove, whatever, you can heat it up to 475, then stick the blade in there for an hour. Softening the steel so that it's not susceptible to chipping or cracking and releasing some of the residual stresses in the steel. This is a really important step as the steel is glass hard right now and just too brittle for use. Now we'll put on the handle. I should have thinned down the handle scales earlier as they're a little too beefy right now, but that's no problem. I'll just use the rasp to profile them. I want them pretty close to their final dimensions, so I'm giving them a rounded profile, then sanding them smooth. What I'm going to do now is secure the handle using epoxy and pins. I intended to use brass pins, but what I discovered right as I was about to put the handle on was that when I had pulled the pin stock out of my supply bin, what I thought was brass rod was actually brass tube, and that really wouldn't have been suitable for this. So instead, I'm just substituting 316 stainless rod, which is actually not really what I wanted, but still, it'll work okay. Now I'll prep the surface for the epoxying. This is a really important step in epoxying. You'll notice that I left all the crud on the blade that formed during heat treating. That'll help inhibit rust, but for proper adhesion to the handle, we need to degrease the tang, then clean all these oxides, the soot, the polymerized oil, whatever crud is on there, we need to get rid of it using a heavy grit Scotch-Brite. Now I'll drive the pins and the thong tube into their holes and test everything to make sure all the holes line up. You don't want to start slathering epoxy on everything only to find out that things don't quite line up. You really are screwed if that happens. But everything looks good. So I go ahead and mix the epoxy. This is just commercial five minute epoxy that you can get down at the hardware store. Since it's five minute epoxy, I'm going to need to work fast, so I need everything laid out and ready to go because I'll be working quickly. As soon as I've mixed the epoxy, I'll slap it on there and press everything together, knocking the pins all the way through. Now, next step is I'll peen the ends of the pins. I'll use this small cross peen hammer to flare out the ends of the pins. Now, this isn't entirely necessary, but flaring the ends of the pins creates a mechanical lock so that even if the epoxy fails, the handle will still hold together. This was the traditional method of attaching handle scales to the tangs of knives. I'm using the cross peen on my hammer to mushroom the end slightly. As I mentioned, I would have preferred to do this with brass, which is much more malleable than 316 stainless. So I left a little too much pin material sticking out and it's not responding quite the way I'd like. But still, we'll get there. As soon as I'm done with the pins, I'll quickly slap some clamps on, making sure to get the ends well clamped. Then I leave it to cure according to the epoxy manufacturer's recommendations. Okay, everything's cured. I'll take off the clamps. Now I'll finish up the handle, filing off any excess pin material and evening things up. Also, I'm removing all the excess wood from the inner and outer surfaces of the handles, and I'm profiling it to make it comfortable to hold.
Then a little sanding, moving up through various grits and stopping at 320 grit. And then some true oil finish. Nothing particularly special about that. You could use tongue oil, you could use wipe on poly, boiled linseed oil, whatever you like. This just happens to be one finish that works pretty well. Once the finish is dry, I'll finish things off with a retention thong. And here's the final product. So despite the fact that this is a pretty unrefined design, it's actually, you know, going to be a very effective cutting tool. Um, you know, one of the cool things about making knives is that they're, you know, you don't have to go about the whole process the same way every time. When I'm making a knife to sell to somebody, you know, I have to sweat every detail, and make sure there aren't any little tiny grinding marks left over and all that sort of thing. Something like this. A couple weeks from now, I'm probably going to find it out in the backyard. My son's going to take it out there with his buddies, drop it. It's going to get covered with rust. And I won't be worried because I didn't kill myself making it. Well, I mean, I did sort of kill myself, but that was my choice. Anyway, bottom line here is knife making is just one of those things that if you really decide you want to do it, you can. And this is testimony to that. If you enjoyed this video, please subscribe to my channel and check out my website, waltersorrelsblades.com, where you can find more of my work. You'll also find plenty more videos there that you can't find on YouTube with very, very detailed information about all aspects of Japanese blade making. Also, like me on Facebook at Walter Sorrels Blades.